All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, Still Point Spaces, uh, for hosting the event and being interested in the topic. So today uh, is the first of a series on kind of discussing this idea of power um, in different manifestations. And basically, um, so the, the first part today, we're going to be talking about just kind of broadening our, our ideas about power, what power is, kind of moving beyond maybe traditional or simplistic ideas of what power is. And they kind of build on each other, the lecture. So the second one is about the ther when a therapist's position of power gets in the way of therapy. And I'll be using my original research with asylum-seeking immigrants uh, to, as part of um, some illustrations for this topic. And then the third lecture, uh, which talks specifically about language and its relation to power, specifically uh, relating to clinical language. And again, I'll also be looking at my original research. And then the fourth lecture, kind of the culminating lecture of all of this, is looking at kind of theories of liberation theology as anti-colonial and emancipatory alternatives to traditional helping roles. Okay, and so I'm just kind of curious, first of all, before I jump into it, um, who in here kind of does social justice work or is a therapist themselves or some kind of humanitarian work? Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so let's talk about the goals for today. So we want to develop a complex, more nuanced perception of what power is and how it flows in our professional, personal, and activist lives. And then, of course, to situate ourselves within these power dynamics. And so I'm going to begin first talking a little bit about my background and then looking at, um, looking at some of the literature from psychotherapy, a lot of it informed by psychoanalytic literature. The third part of this lecture is going to be looking more broadly at psychological definitions of power, maybe from the social psychology field. Uh, but this kind of gets into more traditional ideas, I think, of what we think of with power. And then we're going to kind of really take a step out of psychology and look at uh, Michel Foucault, uh, some of his ideas about power. And then with all of these different ideas of power in mind, we're going to then set out to situate ourselves and uh, refugees um, with a, within an albeit Western perspective. And then at the end, we'll have I'll try to save 30 minutes for discussion. OK, so a little bit about me. Um, so I'll be using my own work and research with asylum-seeking immigrants as motivation for these lectures and as a way of organizing my thinking. My work with asylum seekers awoke me to my individual power as a therapist and the way I could impart another person's fate. For the people I worked with, the danger and loss were more real to them than I could have imagined, yet the asylum process was such that they depended on me to legitimize their fears and give voice to their suffering. The clients had not encountered psychotherapy it was a challenge to explain what I was doing or how it could be personally meaningful to them. So there was also a contextual gulf between us where few assumptions existed. And I found this incredibly interesting as a critic of my field. So it kind of forced me to just explain basic tenets of psychotherapy. So I want to start with a quote from my study um, about a therapist reflecting starting to come to terms with his power as a therapist working with an asylum-seeking immigrant. So it's kind of a long quote, but I'm just going to read it. So he revealed things to me that were done to him and how he responded. And I felt like much more power in that instance because he was revealing things to me that were embarrassing and humiliating to him. And I was sitting there, and I was able to receive that information without responding in kind. There's definitely a differential in disclosure, and I'm receiving this information that is very dear to him, and it's just the nature of the relationship. 
I'm in a sense very powerful in our relationship because he's disclosing this to me and he was in a very powerless position. I think what affected him the most and affected me the most was not necessarily what was done to him, but the way he responded. He felt very humiliated and embarrassed about how he responded while he was in these horrible situations and he felt ashamed. So this is a lot to dive into. It's a lot to unpack. Um, in our training as therapists, we're often told that there's this thing kind of floating around called power and to be aware of it, to not abuse it, but to use it for good. Usually this means advocating for services and protection of vulnerable people, people with vulnerable status. But we don't critique the fact that we have it and we don't critique where it comes from. We just are told, given a cautionary tale, to, to not use it for harm. But I don't think that even the people who teach this, these ideas even know what they're saying. So at first I kind of set out to look for a definition of power um, I looked at the literature on uh, psychotherapy to see what psychotherapists had to say about what power was because certainly there's some dynamic that's happening uh, even in, in psychotherapy sessions where the person is not a survivor of torture, maybe not even traumatized. There is a power dynamic. Um, so looking at this more specifically, we'll look into the, some of the psychotherapy literature. So first we'll situate the client, and this can be any client, this can be an asylum seeker, this can be just one of us going to therapy. So usually when people come into th uh, therapy, they're confused, hurt, traumatized, overwhelmed, misunderstood, alone, at a very vulnerable point in their lives. And they believe that you can guide them, and that you will have special knowledge and special insight into them, that they're struggling so hard to find themselves. So it's a very vulnerable situation. A person comes to you with a lot of vulnerability. And the therapist. The therapist is assumed to have a level of expertise. Uh, the impact of what we say as therapists is great, um, even between sessions. One of the tasks of, or goals of therapy is to actually, this idea of the client internalizing the therapist, internalizing the things that the therapist has to say about you and kind of bringing them into your own view of the self. So that's, all of these things are increasing, ratcheting up the power imbalance. Um, the therapist's sense of reality is not the one that's being questioned. Even in situations where the client might have feelings, uh, strong feelings or accusations about the therapist, the therapist is in a position to call that transference, to say that there's something about that that is back on the, the client themselves, not about the therapist. Also, just kind of uh, therapists um, can practice sometimes outside of the scope of their expertise, and the client doesn't know that. So uh, this can be um, just all of these things where the client does not have the kind of expertise and information that the therapist does. And also depending on your theoretical orientation with therapy, for those who are therapists working with uh, unconscious material, um, the therapist the one, is the one who's navigating through the defenses and is very uh, keen and able to see what the defenses are and to work underneath them. So that's, again, it's clear how powerful the therapist is. And then in addition to any gatekeeping roles that the therapist has to play, um, for example, if you have a, a client who's wanting to transition, um, they need a note from the therapist saying that this diagnosis of gender dysphoria is real. So that's a very concrete gatekeeping role. And then the relationship itself, the relationship itself can, uh, is, is sort of like a, a reparenting relationship where the therapist is giving love to the client. Um, and sometimes the, the relationship itself can become the primary focus and the primary reason for somebody coming to a therapy. But it's a false sense of security in a way because the therapist can always end the therapy. And the therapist also sets the boundaries of the therapy. 
So, and this was actually, this came up uh, in, with a client that I worked with who I did very intensive narrative exposure therapy with uh, about her torture experiences so that she could write an affidavit or so that I could write an affidavit for her. And then when the therapy was over, it was over and our relationship was over. And she wasn't ready for that. But the dictates of my role were that the therapy and the relationship and all of it ended at a certain point in time. Okay. So now, uh, so I knew that, you know, looking at the situation, working with asylum-seeking immigrants, I knew that there was something more than just within the therapy session that could be said about power. There's also our social situatedness outside of the therapy session. So I wanted to look at maybe what the social psychologist had to say about power differentials, asymmetric power relations. So one of the major uh, areas of research that I found was um, this kind of classic idea, and maybe some of you have this idea of your, uh, as a definition of power, this was kind of my definition, the ability to control and access needed resources. So this is kind of a neutral definition. It can also refer to your own power, your own ability to access what you need. Um, so uh, one researcher had a pretty sterile mathematical definition of torture. Um, so looking at this, and all of these, I kind of encourage you as we're looking at these definitions to think of real life examples to kind of like flesh the, give them, give them meat a little bit um, as we talk about these. So does A have a resource desired by B? We could think about a therapy situation, for example. How many sources does B have for this resource? And then to what extent does B have to depend on A for this resource? So not a terribly unique or surprising definition of power, a power asymmetry. So the idea with Neil and Neil was that these most, those most advantaged and disadvantaged by their position in resource exchange opportunities could be identified with this equation. Okay, and now we got into some more um, ideas about a, a power dynamic between two people who are in direct contact with each other. And specifically having to do with observing someone who's more powerful than you. So this is someone, this is B looking at A. So Fisk found that people who were in lower power positions who had to depend on someone in a position of authority, for example, that those people needed the powerful individuals to be as predictable as possible, so much to the extent that they could be, even be manipulated if need be, because they had to survive, they had to do whatever they needed to do to get the resources from person A. So they had to have very nuanced knowledge. They could not rely on stereotypes of the powerful person. Um, so this actually has implications for uh, not forming stereotypes. People who are not as much at risk of forming stereotypes of the other are people with less power because stereotypes are not informative or not actually informative to, or to an extent. So the powerful, in a sense, became very intriguing people to the powerless. And she looked at real life examples of these phenomena as well. She also looked at powerful people and the powerful people, on the other hand, um, they didn't notice as, as many nuances about the powerless. They, which would, and they were prone to, those are the ones who are more prone to stereotyping the powerless, which led to prejudice and discrimination. They weren't dependent on the powerless, there was no need to predict or manip manipulate them. And now perceptiveness and power was another uh, interesting finding. Um, by these researchers, White, Quinote, and Wilkinson. So in this one, these weren't real life situations. It was people coming into a, um, an experiment and they're put into three different groups. And each was primed to be either powerful, powerless, or neutral. And the way that they primed, they were all randomly assigned, so it doesn't matter where they came from um, or what their situation is. So the way that they were assigned to their condition, 
The powerless individuals were told to think of a time when someone else was controlling them. And so those people primed for powerlessness. And then there, the other group of people was primed for a situation when they felt they had control over somebody else. And then those were the powerful people. And then the neutral group was told to just think about what they did yesterday. And so what they did, and this is a very kind of complex uh, study with a lot of apparatuses and all these different things, they put on eye tracking to look at, to compare uh, the way that powerful people and powerless people, how quickly and efficiently they could identify and match shapes on a computer screen. So they found that people who were powerless were very efficient, more efficient than the powerful individuals. And their idea of this was that there was, a, out of necessity, there was an adaptability of powerless people to be able to scan their environments very quickly. And so you can think about, I, I think it, it's, it's also the study is good at helping us to remember not to underestimate uh, kind of the ad adaptive uh, qualities and thinking abilities that people who we might discredit as uh, being lower status social positions is having. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some ideas from Foucault. And one of the reasons that I wanted to look at Foucault is because a lot of the psychology literature that I'd read was much more infatuated with powerlessness. They did much more research on, on the phenomenon of powerlessness. And so I wanted to go kind of step way back and look at some postmodern ideas about uh, what power is. Um, so Foucault talked about repressive power uh, well, the difference between repressive power and normalizing power, we first need to kind of understand this distinction so that we can start to flesh out some ideas from Foucault. So repressive power is the power over somebody else. It's the power that you normally think of, uh, probably most of us, um, when we think of power, dictators, monarchs. Um, so Foucault instead focused on normalizing power where no one is the target, no one is in control. And so some of his ideas are a little slippery, but I think the more types of power that we look at, the more it kind of coalesces and begins to make sense. So we'll look at some quotes by him too. So power functions like a chain, never localized, never in somebody's hand, a power that is not repressive, not telling us no. So, it can be kind of difficult to understand, well, then, then what is it? And in this way, power is everywhere, and it's, it's hard to kind of pin down. Um, so, and also, uh, this idea that people know what they do, they frequently know why they do what they do, but what they don't know is what, what they do does. So, and also this idea that even within a hierarchy, the summer, the summit and the lower elements of the hierarchy stand in a relationship of mutual support and conditioning. Power is diffuse and everywhere produced by everyone. And also another characteristic of it uh, is that people don't feel forced to do things. People feel free. However, they are unaware of how their actions have been shaped outside of themselves. And it's neutral, power is neutral, it's not good or bad. It's productive, it forms knowledge, subjects, discourses. A true power dynamic is not violent, it's not restricting freedom, rather it cannot be practiced without both members being free based on their desires. And also we begin to kind of lay the ground for this idea that um, we're going to try and, even though people are free, we're going to try and somehow shape all of the possible behaviors that they could exhibit in a way that still allows them to feel free and think that they're making free, free choices. So looking at power knowledge. So I'm not gonna go over all the ideas of Foucault, but just touching on a couple that I think are relevant. So definition of uh, power knowledge from the culture theory, key concepts, encyclopedia. Discourses of knowledge are, in fact, an expression of power relations and themselves embodiments of power. So, for example, the construction of trauma, 
the social construction of trauma. The way we categorize experience as trauma, leading to a diagnosis of PTSD, which I'll get into in a minute, as a type of this knowledge produced by power. And then also uh, looking at the role of science and when something is called a science, named a science. Scientific truth is considered the ultimate form of truth, ultimate discourse. This leaves behind or subjugates other knowledges. Question your aspirations to the kind of power that is presumed to accompany a science. And now this next part I want you to really hold in, in your mind throughout the rest of the, uh, the talk. So what types of knowledge do you want to disqualify at the very instant of your demand? Is it a science? Which speaking, discoursing, subjects, subjects of experience and knowledge do you want to diminish? Institutions. So institutions are uh, ways that Foucault is talking about. We can no longer have the state kind of controlling everybody we, the state had to develop institutions to kind of more diffusively control and shape people's behaviors and potentialities. So institutions of correction aimed at controlling one's behavioral potential or future actions. So Foucault kind of grouped these into two categories. One was surveillance. So the police, if you see the police, you suddenly uh, behave in a certain way, you control your behavior and uh, you avoid doing certain things that you know uh, the police would come at you for. But then there's also correction. And I wonder how many of us maybe are, could identify with this, this kind of arm of uh, the institutions that he's talking about. So ideas of correction uh, in medical institutions, educational institutions, mental health institutions. Uh, so the idea is that uh, we, working in these corrective institutions are aiding the state in some, in some way. Um, before anything has a chance to happen, we're teaching people the way that they need to think, the way they need to behave, and also sometimes in the case of mental health, giving medication. So, and in the mental health clinic, for example, psychologists categorize and treat problematic behavior that keeps things running smoothly. So, I often, in New York, when people were brought in to the mental health hospital, it really often felt like it was kind of, either they would come to be psychiatrically hospitalized or they were put in jail. And there was a lot of overlap between people who could have gone in either way. And then also thinking of, uh, I, my field I believe is a, is a bit of an opportunistic field. Um, especially as it tries to assert itself as a science. I think that uh, there was a point, and Foucault also, this is another important concept of his, is that history is always relevant. So why would psychology really start to come into its own, come into a science status at a particular point in time? And he would have argued that it was this point of time that society needed additional ways to control people's behavior people with expertise and the ability to manipulate and predict behavior, and who are able to do it while appearing humane and orderly. So another concept, biopower. The definition, an explosion of numerous and diverse techniques for achieving the subjugation of bodies and the control of populations. So this has to do with reproduction, sexuality, demographics, population growth, death, all of these things uh, that people do throughout the span of their lives. Um, but also looking specifically at the site of the body and finding ways to control the body. To expand this definition, Chu described it as uh, biopower is, is employed through scientific categorizations of populations including categories of health and illness, as well as through disciplinary powers in which surveillance is internalized, including the acceptance of the sick role and its inherent subordination. 
and the medical gaze. So Foucault explored the power exercised by the doctor through the medical gaze, this idea of objectively pathologizing, seeing the body as kind of a collection of pathologies, and really beginning to lay the groundwork for taking the, the other's subjectivity away from them, and then asserting as the doctor, asserting the doctor as the subject. So a lot of this language, even though it's saying, you know, the idea is that power is everybody, everywhere and power can be ex exercised by anyone. There's a lot of language about, around subordination, objectification, sub subjugation, correction, surveillance, and control, but at, as a more humane way of governing. So now we're going to kind of tie all of these things together and talk and, and attempt to situate the refugees, the asylum seekers, and the clinicians. So considering these ideas of power from the therapeutic, social, or asymmetric power to insidious and diffuse power, we'll return once again to the role of power between asylum seeker or refugee and clinician. Can we better situate ourselves with these ideas of power in mind? First, we're going to a Western perspective. We're going to look a little bit about stressors faced by refugees. So, pre-migration stressors. Some of you might be familiar with these already, but I'm just going to kind of go through them. Um, so why do people leave their countries? Uh, threats to their lives, unstable conditions in the host country, war, political violence, religious, ethnic, or LGBTQI-based violence, torture, witnessing murders, the disappearance of loved ones. And during the flight, additional traumatic experiences can mount. Um, so this includes long and predictable travel, more conflict-ridden areas to pass through, a lack of food and water and medical assistance. Children are specifically vulnerable at this point. Um, they're vulnerable at ri for risk of trafficking, sexual exploitation and violence, involuntary drug use and forced violence against others. When they arrive to the host country, uh, they face possible deportation on certain, on certain futures. They're mandated to fulfill certain legal and educational obligations. They're separated from their family, community and friends. They don't speak the language, but there's a lot of pressure to learn the language. Um, in addition, uh, people, the way that the, the people in the host country react to refugees can also be um, with a lot of discrimination, uh, even putting them into detention. They often feel very socially isolated. I often see here uh, in Germany on the news um, a lot of news about growing resentment, uh, kind of the tides turning more and more and more against refugees in this country. And I imagine what it must be like to watch the news um, for someone who is a refugee. So and all the while, with all these traumas, all these, um, all these stressors that are happening, the internal resources and social supports aren't there to help the person cope. And so now, out of necessity, we're going to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, basically because it's something that is often used uh, institutionally and is the, uh, informs the medical gaze and so on. So post-traumatic stress disorder, um, in the West, we would label all of these experiences that I went through, we would label them as traumatic. So this is kind of this Western idea that we would use to describe these set of experiences. And then we would move on to consider a diagnosis of PTSD for someone who has all of these traumas. So really quickly, just to kind of describe what PTSD, the diagnosis of PTSD is, um, the social impacts as we conceptualize them of PTSD include uh, changed views of others, so less trust of others, less trust of humanity, difficulty to form relationships, kind of really shrunken uh, world in the sense that you don't want to experiment, you don't want to go out, you don't want to really make contact with people. Behaviorally, um, people can often avoid things that remind them of 
traumatic experiences, such as people in uniform, um, or maybe they don't want to talk about what happened to them. Thinking. People can have difficulty concentrating, difficulty being present. Uh, they're often troubled by intrusive thoughts, either in their dreams or when they're awake. Um, it's this idea of flashbacks. Emotional impacts, greater anxiety, more easily startled, numbness, shame, so kind of very negative views of the self, possibly also detached and often irritable. So what are the consequences? So going through all of this, probably some of you are really familiar with PTSD, but what are the consequences of medicalizing trauma into a construct of a treatable diagnosis? PTSD has always been linked to, to political world events and it's applied systematically to various groups of people. Um, this kind of started around World War II when they needed to find ways to validate uh, veterans' experiences so that, so that they could get services and treatment. But in talking about um, asylum seekers, the diagnosis of PTSD can strengthen or weaken their asylum case. It is, in a sense, a proof of their trauma. So it's kind of this construct built upon another construct, but really constructing and uh, giving a discourse to all of these experiences within a Western context. So in the proof of trauma, lawyers, and I experienced this myself, um, lawyers would also often call and press me for a diagnosis. They would want me to diagnose their clients with PTSD because it was like a, a golden kind of ticket for their asylum case. However, lawyers don't quite understand that there are individual differences in susceptibility to developing PTSD even if a group of people all experience the same traumatic event, some people are gonna develop PTSD, other people are not. Or maybe some people will have kind of this post-acute traumatic reaction that lasts maybe a few weeks. But by the time they come to us, uh, we're gonna to have to, trying to get a diagnosis of PTSD really depends on a lot of variables. So, the risk of proving trauma via PTSD diagnosis is pretty great. And in a way here, someone's resilience would be working against them, which is, is uh, I don't say lightly, I think is a very important thing to also consider in this exercise of shaping somebody's reality and experiences. Okay, so the asylum process and exercise of biopower. So if we're thinking about it, the refugee or the asylum seeker is moving from a situation where kind of this very traditional, these traditional ideas about power are at play. So like the power over somebody, the torture scenario is happening in the host country. And then they kind of move and shift to a Western context where power becomes very diffuse. So that's a way that we can kind of look at this, where the power that we have as therapists is being used to grant them asylum or not. So the idea of gover governable masses. So all of us, and this is, this is an idea from Foucault, so all of us need to be, the idea is that we all need to be governable in some way through the institutions I was talking about, either through schools, bless you, through schools or um, through medical institutions, through mental health institutions. We all need to be governed in some way. Our behavior potentials need to be governed in some way. So now you have a new group of people coming into the country. How are they going to be governed? So which institutions are we going to call on to govern this new group of people. So the systems in place, and, and, and really I think that in thinking about the different institutions that, that refugees come into contact with, they really, are the, the, they really are those institutions I mentioned, the legal, the educational, think about integration courses, for example. Um, do people know what integration courses are? Okay. Um, and medical and psychiatric. 
So all of these different institutions that have to somehow treat and understand, diagnose, or kind of set the, the refugee on a particular path. So making them, the idea, just for argument's sake, making them governable like the rest of us. And these integration courses are actually, um, they're pretty significant because not only are they learning German, but they're also learning kind of some of the, like the major, you could say, dominant discourses about Germany. So it's important for them to learn that. <clears throat> so, for example, and also a lot of um, people are not really in a position, if they really have gone through a lot of stressful experiences and maybe they do have some difficulties thinking, they're not going to be able to retain all this information in the integration course. They're not going to really be in a position to learn a, a new language. And so what do we do in that situation? Do we say, okay, this person can't be educated right now, but maybe if we give them a diagnosis, then that will kind of explain uh, their role. That'll put them kind of in a sick role so that uh, at least we know we can place them in some kind of way. Okay, and so um, the next slide, I'm going to give you uh, two quotes from lawyers in France given to their asylum-seeking clients having to do with these medical exams. So the first one goes, Sir, further to the hearing at the CRR, in order to obtain refugee status, you must absolutely send me a medical certificate on the traces that remained on your body after the torture and bad treatment inflicted on you, especially as regards your eye. Please feel free to contact me if you encounter any problems. Yours faithfully. Okay, so this second quote. Urgent, dear sir, the CRR has informed me telephonically that it will make its decision only when it has been proved by a medical certificate that the marks on your body do in fact correspond to your account. For that purpose, you must urgently make an appointment with a doctor at the AV, as well as a doctor of Comedo. When you have the medical certificates of these two doctors, please fax them to me immediately. So Fasson and Dalouin discussed, uh, were discussing humanitarian aid work and kind of talking about the exercise of medical power and how the evidence of trauma on the body has to be applied in corroborating their testimony. So, which they believe, and I believe as well, is very objectifying and stripping them of their dignity. So it's not enough that they tell their story, but it has to be physically corroborated or with a diagnosis of PTSD. Okay, and so coming toward the end um, of this lecture, um, so what brings a refugee or asylum seeker to treatment? As we talked about already, the institutional referrals, the asylum application. Sometimes um, the lawyer refers the client because uh, they can't give a coherent testimony of the trauma that occurred. And so they need help to kind of patch it together with the psychologist. But then more interestingly, maybe for us, is what brings us to our work with refugees or asylum seekers. Given that it comes with a role of authority and gatekeeper. So is it mostly to establish a diagnosis of PTSD? We're looking for traces of trauma to be used as evidence, tracing the path of the trauma. So the violence done to the asylum seeker they carry over, is stored in the body and the mind of the refugee. And then we kind of, in our positions, have to decode or interpret this trauma in some kind of way. And then we translate what's happened to them into clinical jargon that's easily metabolized by the state. And so this is kind of our main role, in addition to the actual therapy we might, we might provide. But again, what are our motivations? So our interest in working with people who are oppressed, traumatized, highlights, even though we might feel uncomfortable with it, it highlights the hierarchy that we inhabit together. And in what way are we doing, what are we doing in our clinical roles? Is, is it truly emancipatory when we continue to reduce professional 
produce professional medical discourses that reduce people to victims. So I actually really was thrilled to find this. Uh, do people know who Didier Fesson is? I just learned about him recently, but he was a former vice president of Doctors Without Borders. And he says a lot about critique of humanitarian reason. And so this is a quote, a quote from him, really speaking to this idea of translating the trauma into something that's easily metabolized, right? So it is likely, however, that the translation of his acts of resistance into symptoms of trauma, something is lost in the meaning he intends to give to his life, but also of our possible understanding of the situation. It is this lived individual experience and its possible extension into a collective history that vanish in the translation. And this is kind of about this extracting of the trauma narrative for the purpose of assuring or trying to fight for their ability to, to, to stay, uh, to have asylum. So, and he particularly critiques uh, psychiatric aid workers who have imported the trauma discourse to other parts of the world. Um, if you think about uh, kind of Doctors Without Borders, and there are psychiatrists who are also parts of those teams, they're able to come in and see the situation, and then those people are the ones who go and report back to the rest of the world, to the media, about the conditions in the country are the conditions with the people, the functioning of the people. So they shape a public narrative. So we're kind of going back to this idea of the discourse, the dominant discourse, and the subjugated knowledges, the subjugated discourses. I'm not, uh, and he argues that the people who they're talking about, who they're representing, would use other language to talk about their experience, would frame their experience more in a, in a language of, of resistance, not of victimization, not of trauma. But this probably isn't that um, surprising for any of us to hear. Um, this is kind of the idea of humanitarian aid, this idea of evoking sympathy, and um, this very stark kind of powerless group of people living in another part of the world. So, Fasson says, um, they quote, translate social realities into other social realities, turn combatants into victims. So yes, and other knowledges and discourses are subverted. And we're going to uh, look more at this phenomenon in the third lecture, this kind of just like in the therapy session, how this happens all the time in the therapy session, kind of reframing and um, describing something as traumatic when, and looking for clues and flags that something is actually traumatic when maybe it could be something else. So again, looking at what are our motivations. Uh, so when we shape this kind of discourse, and we talk about people who are suffering and that we kind of come in to a situation where people are suffering. Given our history of colonization and other barbarism uh, committed by the West, do we redeem ourselves in these situations where we describe our role as humanitarian working with people who are all traumatized? We portray ourselves as the heroes of our time and represent the best of humanity situated against the worst of humanity, and doing what the worst of humanity has done. So I'm not advocating that we do nothing, that we completely stop doing, doing something, but recognize that the more we kind of shape these discourses, making us look like heroes, the more we do that, the less it is about true social justice. So that's what I would argue. And the importance of the, the subjugated discourse and knowledge that is actually needs to start to be brought up to the surface and heard. So that's the end of our lecture.
Um, next week, we're going to be talking about uh, position, therapist's position of power gets in the way of therapy, and um, continuing to consider the implication of power in this scenario. So that's it. And so we have time for a discussion if people have questions or comments. What's the relationship for you of power and empowerment? Power and empowerment. I think that empowerment can be kind of an almost facile way of um, looking at uh, trying to tell somebody, okay, we're going we're gonna to empower you, we're going to kind of get you up to these situations where you can begin to access things for yourself. Um, that's kind of the traditional idea of empowerment. But I think that for somebody who truly has power and is unaware of it and is unaware of all the complexities of it, I think it's very difficult to actually truly instill that sense of empowerment and try to, try to help somebody uh, encounter uh, increased empowerment. Um, so I think that there is a relationship between being conscious of your own power and being truly, truly able to empower. Um, and yeah, I think that's what I would say about that. Mm -hmm. And you talked about translating social realities into other social realities. And this made me think, because for me, somehow communicating with people is a lot about trying to translate what they say into something I can identify with somehow. And I guess you somehow try to communicate it's been done too much, for example, in therapy. Is there a practical way of avoiding this? Or have you thought of some, I don't know, some good measures to, to do this less? Well, I think that's a great question. I think, um, I think part of it, if you are going to, like, like you're right, in a, in a typical, I think it's very natural. I don't want to say that kind of translating social realities into other social realities is something that we should completely avoid because it's something that is just kind of the way that, that Foucault kind of talks about discourse being formed and it's kind of inevitable. But I think in the situation where, but that's an, if you have a situation where two people really have the possibility of being heard, then I think that that can be maybe a less dangerous situation. But in the one that I described in humanitarian aid sites, it's really only one party, only one person has the voice. And so it's completely, uh, the other one doesn't have any access to the world, to speaking to the world. Only, it only kind of relies on this one. And they don't have any real direct relationship to what's going on. And so it, it's kind of being able to, to understand the limits of your situatedness and what you can see and what you can't see. Um, and then finding ways to allow that person, finding ways to help that person access uh, the ability to speak, the ability to be heard, instead of always kind of taking, taking the stage in a way. Mm -hmm. And so, what's your question with uh, how?
the contrary of that can be actually reinforcing um, this political, um, uh, yeah, uh, the potential political <coughs> impact that the victim of power could have on society. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I hope to talk more about that in, in the fourth lecture about accompaniment. I think that um, that people, you can really go either way depending on the way that your therapist kind of sees her role and kind of has, and I think this also kind of gets to the question of empowerment, the first question that was posed. Um, to what extent, and, and, and I mean it's a perfect question because it's also the therapist is also has the power to kind of guide where the client is going to go with the situation. And I think that there are ways of kind of just shutting that down and saying, okay, you're going to be, you're just this traumatized person. We're going to kind of help you get over your symptoms. We're going to maybe give you medication. Or, you know, what can you do to make meaning of your experiences? What do you want to do? Do you want to make greater meaning of your experience? Um, and then helping to facilitate that. Being kind of, uh, this idea of accompaniment is you tell me, you kind of guide the process. You guide the idea of where you want to be, uh, what you want to do with your story, with your experience. And really helps to kind of round out the person, making them three-dimensional. So they're not just their trauma, they're not just reduced. Because I think people might actually feel very much like, especially with trauma, they might feel that there is, uh, there's kind of such a break in, their, in the span of their lives. Where it's just, they're feeling only defined by this traumatic experience. And I think that if you can get them to kind of smooth uh, their life narrative, smooth that into their, their life narrative and see the different possibilities for them going on, then I think that that would be, that would be good feminist therapy. Anything else? Um, I'm also interested in the cultural implications of this because I assume that the disclosure of the these experiences or the depth of the sorrow or the trauma that they went through is not uh, approach the same way as it would be approached in the Western world. I mean, I was working with some refugees before, and I know that mm -hmm. you don't see the role of psychologists or of psychiatrists as something necessary for right. their well-being. Right. And, and often pain itself is being uh, seen as something shameful or something right. you cannot control yourself. Mm -hmm. So how does that play a role in defining whether somebody has, is really suffering from a PTSD or not? So if somebody, you're asking for people who feel that they don't have anything, that they don't want to be involved with psychiatric care or mental health treatment, how do you diagnose PTSD? Yes, or their narrative. Their narrative would not be as coherent, or they wouldn't want to indicate the level of stress or the pain that they are through. I think that one way is kind of, if it really hinges on them getting access to asylum, I think one way is kind of uh, just informing them of, I mean it's, I don't like saying this, but kind of informing them of what the, um, what the actual conditions are for what is going to allow them to get, um, uh, what's going to allow them to get a, an asylum uh, ruling. Um, if they get asylum granted. And I think that um, to an extent, like part of this, there's the therapy, but then there's also this kind of screening where you're trying to explain the, the institutional structure of how somebody is brought in. Um, and I think that if you can kind of, and the lawyers are involved, and if you can kind of tape together like a, a, a trauma narrative, and also if you can identify symptoms, and kind of be very open and transparent with them about the, the whole process. I think that can be useful, but um, I think it's also we need to make space for people who don't have traumatic symptoms and for them to also be able to, to stay in the host country, for them to also get asylum without having to meet this criteria, without having to go see a therapist at all. And it's kind of this, even with this, this idea of uh, 
medical, you know, physical scars. What if oftentimes people are physically tortured, but they don't have any physical scars? They're not missing any, any limbs or anything. So it's very, it just kind of highlights the problem with the way that we need to, the way that socially we've, we're set up to have to diagnose people in order to protect them. So it's, I think it, I think, I mean, it's a very complex situation where we want them to still feel their own dignity without having to kind of strip it away through this proof that is needed to qualify what they're, what they're saying. So, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm having a bit of difficulty trying to ask you my question because uh, I um, it actually brings out a lot of really troubling notions that I've had for some time about kind of modern humanitarianism. Uh, so the, the high differential, differential that you mentioned in, in your clinical work to me seems to be uh, founded, it seems to be inherent on, on our uh, asylum regime in that the, the whole idea is Offering asylum is we give to the harvest, right? we offer something to the harvest. Mm -hmm. It's predefined that people will accept it, are the harvest. And so a, a lot of these uh, institutions seem to be built around the idea of proving that they're the harvest. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's a kind of twist on the entire idea of therapy to begin with. But then if you go further back from that, so you can say that it's so the same about the entire modern humanitarian movement, mm -hmm. about the idea of. Uh, we're helping the weak, we're helping the balance, right. and it's us who defines, right. who gets to say what the balance that's any of the entire kind of uh, universe of equality of human rights. We decided this is the standard by which we shall judge who are the people who need humanitarian, mm -hmm. humanitarianism. And uh, we uh, put ourselves in the situation, in the position to impose that, whatever, whatever it is. Right? Yeah. Um, and for me, the most troubling notion actually is something I've had myself. One of the, the last things you said, which is, uh, you said, you're not suggesting that you, we should do less of this. And I feel the same way. I also wonder why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we do less? Yeah. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think that we just need to be, I mean, I think there, there's a lot that you said, and I think this idea, first of all, of there, there's, there are conflicts, there, there, there are things happening all over the world. Why do we choose the places we choose to go to? Why do we highlight the ones that we highlight and go to those and not others? Um, I think that there are usually political motivations for that. There's something about going to a particular area that we want to say about our relationship with that country or with that particular type of problem or that particular type of uh, group that's been targeted. There's some stance that, there, there's something symbolic about our choosing which places to involve ourselves in. Um, and as far as, you know, do we do nothing? Well, I mean, we, I think that we have to also look into our colonial history and look at the causes and effects of what we've done, um, what we've perpetrated in the past, and maybe operate not so much from kind of this, uh, this idea that we uh, just have to give, um, but that we, we've also taken. And we, have to, we can't just kind of replace one narrative with another. We have to retain these ideas um, of what we've done and our involvement in the conflict itself. In what ways have we created those conflicts? Um, and then to kind of proceed with that consciousness. I mean, that's just, that's just one idea, but I think, I think that it's just, and it also, I mean, ideally you would also have the people who are, who you're going to uh, also uh, being in charge of whatever um, help or aid is is going on, um, but I, I think it's I think it's just really really complicated, and people a lot of people aren't ready for looking at themselves, looking at their history in that kind of way. But yeah, what is our responsibility? 
kind of I kind of want to refer to the first part of the lecture about the power of itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that also psychotherapy, like it's not one thing, right? We have many different ways of being psychotherapists, like yes. behavioral cognitive, psychodynamics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that for example, like I don't know how many people here are from the psychodynamic school, but the question of power is also the question of the transparency. And even when we get back totally to this traditional Freudian model of like, you know, triangular Oedipal situation mm -hmm. and the killing of the father, like the power is in the Freudian, the psychodynamic, psychodynamic psychotherapy is already like a structure, right? Like, so this power relation when the patient is coming to us, and a certain transference mm -hmm. of, I don't know, like can the other or like the client of really caught mother, it's, mm -hmm. it's always a transference towards a place of the power. And I'm just wondering, like, because questioning this place, from the clinical point of view, it doesn't really make any sense because the whole sense is in the transference and the interpretation of the transference, right? Mm -hmm. And the transference, in this sense, is always connected to the ethical complex from the dynamic point of view. And even like, like you know, Nancy Hodorov, like a feminist psychoanalyst, mm -hmm. she was saying that the only power that is brought up in psychoanalysis is the power between the child and the mother, and mm -hmm. she's, saying, she's saying that the power is always on the side of the male who is aggressive towards the dependency on the big mother. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, I'm kind of like wondering like, about the power structure in the psychotherapy, which is how to distinguish between when our privileges as a power situation are coming in into the, into the psychotherapeutic room, that I am a white European male being psychotherapist, and where is actually the part of the tr transference which is based somehow on this relation of dependency? And for me, this is kind of a problematic question of, of the power relationship with psychotherapy. And as well, I would like to think about, because I'm also making a research of something called situated psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. with like Donna Haraway may be thinking that every psychoanalysis is taking place in locality and maybe also like there's this term of intersectionality in psychotherapy that's not to hide your privileges and the history, colonialist history and you know cultural background, but rather be open about it that okay part of transference of my client is based on the privileges I cannot resign from because I'm born in mm -hmm. them, right? So like I don't know really this is such a complex term mm -hmm. the power of psychotherapy that I think there's no real answer because it's also part of the clinical perspective for me. It's it's part of the kind of setting, part of the magic, I guess, in a way, of what allows a particular type of therapy to unfold and to happen. Like you have to have those ingredients for that kind of therapy. Um, and I think that I think you can, I think you're absolutely right that you can be, um, and it very actually can be very powerful in a therapy to be um, open about, and it takes, a, it takes a while to get there in my opinion, but to be very <laughs> vocal and um, very upfront about kind of situated privilege. Um, it's, I mean, I, I would say that probably a lot of this power the power dynamic, but also the, the power that's coming from kind of outside the therapy room, just you as a white male, whatever, is probably playing in the therapy, I would guess for a lot of people, months before it's ever talked about. Because those kinds of dynamics of like race or um, like colonial history, gender, are so... Um, are, are so difficult to, especially when the therapist is kind of a, in a position of power and hasn't, maybe hasn't been thinking about their own, you know, like a lot of times with white people don't think about their own uh, racial privilege until much later in life compared to someone, a person of color who's coming to the therapy. So they're much later in kind of the game of having, like evolving their thoughts around that. And so, um, and also I think while the therapist has a lot of power, uh, this other part that I talked about with the person having less power, being very perceptive 
of, of the therapist that I think is also at play. Um, so I think that it definitely, it's very rich uh, stuff to work with when you, when you can as a therapist, but it's actually, I think a lot of therapists I've talked to don't really know how to do that. No? because that's actually a huge discussion right now in mm -hmm. the trainings in Europe, like the psychotechnical training, is how much should we involve in the clinical training, not only the clinical part of learning how to become a therapist, but also how should we implement these critiques of our position as a psychotherapist according to the, our situation. And yeah. I think that this is very important. Very important, I agree. Like very open and yet become very conscious about your situation and your, you know, your privilege, your, your situated privileges, and then to somehow like be very clear about it during the clinical process, somehow also to get it in the room. I know what you mean. It's so hard to, to be kind of in the protective space of, of like a group, like a group of therapists talking about something or a classroom talking about something, and then to actually apply it clinically. A lot of people will kind of say, their kind of entree into that will be like, so, I'm white, you're black, what's that like? That's kind of some of the like, typical questions. And it's usually, um, and actually, I'm, I'm going to be using a quote in, I think, next week uh, that touches on this, like the intersectional stuff. Um, but it's really, it really falls flat oftentimes if you kind of lead in that way. And it's hard to know um, how to, you know, do you as the therapist bring that up or do you wait for the client to bring it up? Um, it's a very rich area, very interesting area. Mm -hmm. uh, hey. I can hardly see you. Uh, okay. Um, I hope this is relevant. Um, learning by my hour in the next is super interesting. We'll talk about that later. Uh, anyway, um, uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I think it's super good. Oh, thanks. I've been really thinking uh, on one thing uh, while we're sitting here uh, because you presented certain ways of looking at, at uh, uh, studies on, on power relations mm -hmm. that could teach uh, psychotherapists in training so they understand what kind of power relation they are in. Mm -hmm. But it's also power can be fairly fairly simple because when you're fresh and just starting to become a therapist, usually you feel like you don't have that much power and you're very uncertain where you can help at all. But the moment you are helping someone, uh, the moment they ask for your help, there is a hierarchy there. Mm -hmm. It's fairly simple as well. Yeah. Um, to to be able to help someone, you have to accept that power, that power hierarchy. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to enter hierarchies. Mm -hmm. um, and then, especially in this economic tradition, we discuss a lot about instrumentalization of that power. Uh, being a neutral figure, to be protected things on to, rather than sharing, that's important to know. Uh, and uh, to be able to offer help at all, you, there needs to be an idealization in place to work at internal models and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I really like the, the, the mixture because you're sort of saying also, look at this tool, it, it, this, this tool of power, it comes with a, a what do you say, like two, two edges of the sword, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> just, just a last one to the comment from, from the, behind me. Um, why do we do it? And, like, should we do this? Well, that's fairly simple as well. If the mandate and authorization you are given is to help, so you have to help, and then we have to use the tools that are available, and you're a good description of the tool. No, thank you. I mean, I think also the other thing is therapists vary in their competence. So there are a lot of therapists who, for, for many reasons, um, are very powerful and are doing harm. They're being destructive, maybe without even realizing it. So, in, to what extent, you know, do are people really beholden to their role, their high, high role of high responsibility? 
Like to what extent do people really take that seriously? I think the first step is to recognize it. Um, and then just, I mean, as a, a, as a student, I think, and even beyond studying, I think, I think that the way to do it is to kind of not practice in a vacuum, but to uh, kind of use a lot of kind of recordings of your sessions, listening to them yourself after the session, and then listening to them with a the supervisor you trust, listening to them in a group, kind of subjecting your sessions to other people so that you're in a way like knowing that what you're doing is also going to be evaluated by other people who have the same amount or more power than you do. And then to start to kind of start, start from there and like see yourself, look at yourself uh, from outside, from also from outside of your role with the help of your colleagues and your supervisors. Thanks. <laughs> You have to diagnose people in order to protect them. And then I wonder what would be the way to protect them without diagnosing them. Is there a way that you have to share with us maybe not? So protecting, so protecting people by diagnosing them with PTSD so that they can be, so that they can get asylum and alternatives to that? It's so rigged because You know, you, you want to just address somebody kind of outside of, just, just as, a, as, a, as a human being. You, want to, you don't want to have like the state in your session. But, but sometimes, I mean, it's this real, like you also have to be really, it goes back to the power, aware of the own power too, you have to be aware of the way that someone is going to gain, gain safety, someone's going to access safety. And um, I think it's really, I think, I think really you would have to, not just within your role as therapist, but you have to kind of take on another role not just as therapist, but as, as someone who can speak back to the way that um, things are being regulated. So uh, taking a role as an activist, a lot of times, um, or as like a, someone speaking out legally against something um, I, that doesn't involve the patient like directly, but is really kind of trying to change the way things are. I think that's something that you can do to protect that therapeutic space and those therapeutic possibilities. Um, and then, you know, otherwise it ends up really being like, okay, we've got this task of asylum to deal with and this, this diagnosis of PTSD that you may or may not have. And then we also have, you know, it goes back to, well, what is, what is this thing that I do? What is this psychotherapy thing? And is this even relevant to you? trying to really understand if it's something that the person really wants. I think maybe that could be empowering in some way. Like, does the person really want therapy? I was also thinking about how does it feel for a therapist? I think it's like any social experiment because most likely they're there because they want to help. And it seems like the way to help is to put a label. I really yeah, and then sometimes if they don't meet criteria for PTSD, you can't diagnose them. And that's seen as, as like a failure. And so what is that doing also to, to the asylum seekers' kind of feelings about themselves? Like, if, you, if they're there for this diagnosis but you can't give it to them, do they feel like they've failed something by not having this diagnosis? Um, I thought of the possibility of giving a diagnosis in order to protect the, the patient or the client and then having the understanding between the therapist and the client that this is a political strategy, this is a strategy in order to protect them, but 
you'll do a more nuanced uh, work together to understand the situation yeah. and not just find them like this? Yeah. Is that yeah, I mean, are you talking about in the case where someone doesn't really have meet criteria for PTSD or where they do? Um, um, I think, like, I, I totally get that question. I think, because um, you want to be able to do both, like everything, you want to be able, because, uh, but I think that it's impossible to say, okay, I've made the diagnosis of PTSD, your asylum application has been submitted, and now let's move on to the therapy. Like, I think that that's always, those kinds of things, like those gatekeeping roles and, and actions are always, they're always present. They're always in the back of your mind or somehow in the room, even if you don't talk about them. They're, they always color what's happening. Um, I think you can totally, I think it, yeah, and I, I, think, I think that you totally could, I mean, you could try to proceed that way and just say, like, this is kind of a necessary evil that we have to do, and, and then we'll also, you know, try to do some therapy as, as long as it's meaningful to you and figure out how this could possibly be meaningful to you. Um, and then, you know, kind of, but I, I think, so I'm kind of thinking of like the worst, I sometimes think of the worst case scenarios with these kinds of, it's like an ethical dilemma in a way. So if you think about it, it's kind of, um, and the worst case scenario would be that the person says, okay, I'm going to meet criteria for PTSD and then I better keep that, I better keep that up throughout the whole therapy. I better kind of not look like I'm actually didn't have the diagnosis at all. Like I, I better maintain this diagnosability of, of PTSD. So that could be maybe an example of a risk that would be, that would be part of that um, kind of agreement of going into the therapy. Um, and, but I think also in the situation where if someone doesn't meet, doesn't meet criteria of PTSD, you can still advocate for them and still, still say, you know, in this kind of language, like they have symptoms that, I mean, because the language with PTSD is on an affidavit is like this person shows symptoms, uh, showing, meeting criteria for PTSD, which is similar to other people who have experienced trauma um, in these kinds of situations. So they look like these other people who we know have experienced trauma. So if you can say, even pull parts of that out and try to advocate for somebody, um, I think in some situations you have to because I, I wouldn't say that giving someone a diagnosis of PTSD if they don't have it, I don't think that's a good idea either. It's very, it's very troubling and complicated. Yeah. Aren't you discussing two different things? Because you're, you're, you've been talking about using diagnostic bureaucratically to gain rights and to, to gain access to country. Mm -hmm. As a therapist, you're allowed to put diagnosis in without criteria. You can offer therapy to someone without them having the diagnosis. If you give someone a diagnosis, though, would very discouraging to follow the manual for that diagnosis. So right, no, but I'm talking about just like an internal agreement between the therapist and um, the patient. You know, with the patient with, yeah, because I've encountered this. Yeah, that's you know, so that that's I very common. Yeah. The easy answer is you're not allowed to do that. So maybe you're seeing yeah. more than. Uh, I know, I know that it's a risk, but it's, a, it's kind of a. Um, 
sure it is. Did I answer your question? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. No, 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 I think it, yeah, I think it also just, it, yeah, I mean, I think that it is a case by case, and if you, if the person feels, or the client feels comfortable, not, they don't want that diagnosis, but they know they have to get it for a certain thing, and they, and then they can feel, they can make peace with that. Yeah. Yeah, and some people like having a diagnosis of PTSD. It feels very validating to a lot of people as well. So, mm hmm But I just want to say that from what I know in Germany, that like hardly ever people are diagnosed with, uh, what was that in English? PTSD. Oh, it's, yeah. It, What was the first word? Anpassung Anpassungsstörung. Anpassungsstörung. Uh, for the refugees, it's like the most diagnosed, so it's not actually. Oh, you know what I bet that is? Adjustment disorder. Yeah. Adjustment disorder. Adjustment disorder. That's the light version of PTSD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've also had experiences. I've had experience with pa with patients who've been very angry at that diagnosis. I mean, I'm not saying that it doesn't work like for other situations. I think it, you know, maybe would be the go-to if if it could if if that can get help somebody get asylum too, then then great, you know. Um, I'm not sure how it is in Germany. Okay. I just have a kind of, I'm not sure if it's really a good question, uh, it just makes me really curious. Like, who came up with this? <laughs> because presumably somebody said at one point, sat down and said, okay, we only accept people with PTSD or exercise disorder. And presumably that, that person has some kind of uh, psychiatric expertise, hopefully. Well, no, it's kind of a So who came up with PTSD? Is no, that your question? Oh. I don't exactly know the path, but I think we should try to, to change that because it's just a very, it is, I think, a very convenient way of mostly excluding people from asylum, mostly finding ways to exclude them, you know, so we don't have to take them, don't have to bring them in. That way, 
we're not saying that we're not bringing in traumatized people into our country. That way we're saying, oh, we're bringing in people. We don't need to bring in people who aren't really disturbed. There's nothing really going on with them. They can go back to their countries. So it makes it just kind of a, it gives us a good narrative, something, a good foothold. No, just a bit too hard to this because this is the topic which is like super crazy about this is many years. Because actually, many psychotherapists right now in Europe are trying to fight DSM and trying like to free the diagnosis from the DSM diagnosis. But the problem is that there is a huge amount of money invested also in the in the med medical issues. And like you know, right now we have almost a, a medicine for each category in DSM, which is different, you know, and like we have all this anti all of these things that are going accordingly to this scheme. And the problem is that every single time you want to touch it and you want to change it, there is a huge corporal resist. Mm -hmm. It's actually in some way also not only politics, but also a huge business in diagnosing people, you know? And so it's a very complicated situation, like trying to explain your question. It's, it's not that someone came up with it, it's actually a very complicated mechanism. I don't think it I don't think it, it's that black and white but I think I can speak mostly for the US um, I think it, it really puts your application at a much uh, greater uh, status is much more likely to get asylum. It's not like an automatic, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an important diagnosis for that. Yeah, it is. And I'm not even familiar with how, I, I actually, I'm completely naive to how psychology is practiced here, so I didn't, I didn't know like to what extent the DSM was used outside of the US, you know? Yeah. Not the, ICD. My last job, it was switched. It was the reverse because they just came out with the DSM-5 and they didn't want to use that anymore, so we had to use ICD codes on the computer. But anyway, whatever. But I mean, we can kind of, for those who are interested in Foucault <laughs> and trying to grapple with his ideas, I think these questions. Can, we, can, we can think about, we can kind of broaden the way we think about them the more we read Foucault. Like why, you know, why the question with the conch and casa? Why the, you know, the question with the money, the economical incentive? Why is all this happening at this point in time? It's always just that question. It's just stepping back and just looking at what else is going on. Anybody else? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, okay. Thank you so much.